Stanford University. So let's continue our conversation to pick it back the last topic we discussed regarding the innovation, the battery, et cetera. As we heard this morning, California is leading the country in all different kind of metrics regarding the zero emission vehicles, including the largest market share of electrical vehicle percentage, the most extensive charging infrastructure. But the Sally Benson mentioned that we have a single point of failure, which is a critical material supply chain because of many reasons. So next panel, we are going to discuss battery manufacturing and the supply chain. The panel will be led by Professor Yi Chui, the first director of Stanford Sustainability Accelerator, and also the former Precore Institute director. And I have to give the credit to Yi, because the, what we have today for this conference is all because about 10 or 11 months ago, when uh, uh, Yi a room met with uh, Chair Housechild and the Commissioner Monaghan. We're kind of brainstorming how academic and government can work in together, bring the folks from industry, from the investment communities, from entrepreneurs, really dis dis come together, discuss the energy transitions. Without further ado, let's welcome Professor Yi Chui. Good afternoon. Um, it's my great pleasure to uh, moderate the, uh, the battery panel. Let me welcome all the panelists to uh, sit down first. I will do a quick introduction. Um, as Liang said, this event of Stanford CEC Day, the California Day, we have been planned for about a year. I'm so happy to see the very, very exciting program so far. Throughout the day, you have seen in each panel, I was counting how many times batteries were mentioned. Long duration energy storage is, is mentioned. So now this is the time, let's discuss uh, this uh, super important topic. Um, before we mo move on to panelists, let me share with you in the past roughly five years, at Stanford we launched Storage X Initiative uh, Will Chu and me, we have been building this initiative and now engaging uh, roughly about 30 labs in the order of 200 graduate students, postdoc researchers into the ecosystem. And also in the past decade, in the battery space, Stanford spin out roughly 16 to 20 companies related to value chain of batteries. In today's panelists, we are going to see two of our own products right here as alarm. They uh, founded, co-founded the companies uh, and uh, representing uh, what Stanford has been uh, contributing to building out the California ecosystem. Now let me introduce four panelists. All the way to the left is uh, Rod, Colwell, CEO of Control Thermal Resources Holding. Uh, next is uh, Chiran Gopal, CTO and co-founder of Mitchell Cam, one of our own Stanford's product. And uh, next one is uh, Prabhaka Venkaraman, CTO of Spots. And last but not least is uh, Richard Wang, founder and CEO of Kilberg. Indeed, I was, it was my great pleasure. Richard was my graduate student before. And these four people actually cover a big part of the value chain from lithium mining to the materials production to the cell making and the next generation of high performance cell as well. With that, I'd love to give them, each person, five minutes to introduce what you have been working on, and then we'll go into the panel discussion. Let's start uh, with Rod, please. Thank you so much. It's really a privilege to be here again. It's been a few years, so thank you so much for the kind invitation and to be associated with such an esteemed uh, panel, half of being alumni. So uh, it's wonderful. I'm here to um, introduce you to our project. Uh, the folks that you don't know our project, we're located down in Imperial Valley. Uh, in Southern California. So the 
Our vision, uh, I've been a CEO firstly for this company for the last 12 years, so believe it or not, 12 years. We achieved groundbreaking only uh, late last week on this project, which is the first stage of a Lithium Valley campus. And what I'm talking about the campus, and I think some of the subject matter here today is around, can we take uh, green lithium, in our case, to the next step, to CAMS, cathode and battery cell. My colleagues obviously can hit on that. So the, a little about the Salton Sea geothermal resource. It's a uh, long-term resource that's been in existence for over 40 years, it's operating. Um, it's a known mineralised resource that's been validated by DOE and others. But I, th I guess more, more importantly, uh, there are over 11 plants down there that have been operating for 42 years. So there's this huge consistency in operating history. There's nothing new and novel about that field. And, and really what we're doing is taking geothermal power and minerals to the next level. Um, we're developing seven stages, which will produce a capacity of 170,000 uh, tonnes per year lithium hydroxide and uh, which ultimately will produce 350 megawatts of 24-7 geothermal clean energy. Um, the total, our total resource, the uh, Hell's Kitchen resource, will produce 1.1 gigawatts and th equivalent to 300,000 tonnes per year. So it has scale and scalability, and I'll talk a little bit about that. It also has the highest sustainability standards for lithium and power production in the world today. We uh, commenced a groundbreaking. This was on Friday with the White House officials, the state, the Energy Commission there. So it was a very proud moment for us. I mean, 12 years to get to day one on private sector is a tough thing. And I think there was a lot of jobs offered about going to public sector. I think I might be talking to a few folks after this, but it's been an arduous journey. We've done the right steps through CEQA, public engagement. And a lot of the conversations that were, were discussed today, um, we've done it and, and live and breathe uh, this uh, project. As you can see here, this is obviously a concept. The power plants from stages one to seven are pretty much set, the locations. The field is pretty much a constant. You know, you can, to get to capacity in this type of development, we uh, just drill more wells. The brine is the same. We drill down about 8,000 feet. That brine is approximately 600 degrees Fahrenheit. We flash steam is how we cool the brine. And then we recover lithium by proper pretreatment and uh, and we recover lithium uh, chloride, then uh, convert that to lithium hydroxide. The infill parts are what we're here to talk about. The real opportunity per the IRA in California and the Lithium Valley, uh, Lithium Valley Commission discussion, which I was fortunate enough to be a commissioner and leadership under the CECs, what can we do beyond just exporting bags of lithium overseas to create a f carbon footprint to ship that all the way back here? We're here to produce clean green lithium for General Motors and Stellantis, both of our customers, and to take that to the next level, which of course some of our colleagues are, are working on those styles of projects. This is a closed loop system. There are no evaporation ponds. There's no reagents. There's nothing. This is completely closed loop. So we basically, from you know step one, uh, as you see stage one in here, um, we. We flash steam into a steam turbine, makes energy, it cools the brine. We, uh, we basically then remove silica and polymetallics, which are green, also salable products, as nothing goes into a landfill out of this product project. We uh, remove the lithium from the brine through direct lithium extraction and convert to carbonate or hydroxide or uh, lithium metal, um, those options being a chloride base. Of course, the opportunities on the far right here with the discussions and negotiations for battery cell, PCAMs, CAMs, and other ancillary recycling and other uses that can be co-located into one campus and be fed with, with clean energy in the form of steam and electricity. Milestones over the years, I won't dwell on these too much. I've probably used my time up, um, but it's been a, a long, very sort of calculated process. So, Jobs, you know, social responsibility, the 480 construction jobs. We have project labour agreements with our brothers and sisters in the uh, California trades. Um, an estimated 940 good paying jobs from capacities to one, stages one to seven. Direct jobs and commitments, um, <coughs> quality, the whole bit. I mean, this has been a, uh, it's not just a private enterprise building a project. This has been a, a group effort and community effort truly over the last uh, 12 years. So with that, thank you.
pass you on. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, very nice to be part of this esteemed panel. Thank you, Eve, for again inviting me here and uh, moderating the panel as well. Uh, my name is Chiru Gopal. Uh, I'm the CTO and co-founder at Metrochem. And uh, Metrochem is a uh, iron-based lithium-ion cathode manufacturer. Uh, we are based out of Mountain View, about five miles out of here. Um, we are a startup company founded about uh, two and a half years ago with a focus on um, innovating and commercializing uh, LFP-based cathodes. Uh, we have chosen cathodes as our product roadmap with the idea that cathodes make up about 60 to 70 percent of the bill of materials to a cell, and the way to drive cost improvements um, involves basically reducing the cost of a cell, and a lot, lot of that comes from uh, reducing the cost of cathodes. So our product roadmap involves uh, scaling a deployable technology, which is lithium ion phosphate. It is the only cathode right now that gives you the right combination of durability, stability, cost, and supply chain resiliency. Um, it already exists in the market today, and it can be readily scaled up. And then our intent is to be able to layer on improvements in energy density without compromising on cost and safety through introduction of next generation cathode variants. Um, our customers, several of whom are strategic investors in the company, are those that value a cathode uh, in their cells that uh, prioritizes a safety, uh, stability, or cycle life over time, and cost. So um, we, our product portfolio targets mass market EVs, medium duty trucking, uh, and grid scale uh, energy storage. So what, what, what makes Metrochem unique? Um, it's our focus on building only cathodes, and specifically ion-based polyanion cathodes that retain the safety of LFP while attempting to reach the energy density of the mid-nickel NMC 622-like cathodes. Um, what we bring as a differentiator is our speed of scaling from R&D to pilot scale, being able to commercially de-risk products, and with a focus on scale from day one. We ultimately believe that uh, companies in deep tech space always have heavy investments in R&D, which can sim sometimes be very hard to scale up over time. So we have to start with a product that a customer wants today that exists in the market today. And LFP is a perfect vehicle for us to do that. Um, in terms of, again, with the focus on scale, we have chosen a process technology that has been uh, used to make several hundreds or thousands of kilotons of LFP in the last few years. Uh, so that we can prioritize speed to market. So we use a carbon thermal uh, uh, synthesis-based approach to go from the raw materials I've shown in the slide to a finished cathode product. And then the intent is to use the same process technology, same manufacturing equipment, and then layer on the product differentiation that we are developing currently in the lab. Um, scaling in the US is a very different challenge than scaling in Korea or scaling in China, which largely make up all of the cathode supply chain today. And we very much realized that what works and what is low cost in China might not necessarily be low cost or even sustainable in the US. So we are leveraging partnerships with several upstream and, um, um, upstream and you know, cross-stream suppliers as well to be able to make cathodes in an environmentally responsible way as well um, as we go along into our um, scale-up journey. Uh, just a quick plug on where we are, uh, we are already I said we are a startup based in the Bay Area, but we have been uh, using rented lines um, in several geographies to be able to demonstrate that we can make LFP at scale so that a customer that we work with can sample materials at a scale that's relevant to building an EV. Right? So hundreds of kilograms of um, LFP that we are able to ship. So we have uh, gone end to end and made several tons of LFP through rented manufacturing equipment. And um, we are actively in the point of doing site selection to set up our first mass production facility uh, in the United States. Um, so this is sort of our scale-up roadmap, and I'll leave it with that. Um, we are targeting being able to be at the scale of about 30 kilotons per annum or so by 2028, um, starting with LFP as our uh, entry product with the ability to layer on the higher energy density products as we go along. Thank you. Unfortunately, I don't have any slides, but uh, I think uh, my colleagues have explained the value chain very well. But I'll just briefly go over what Sparks is doing. We are also uh, 
Uh, we make LFP uh, cathodes similar to Mitrachem uh, and also cells. Uh, we are trying to do both. And uh, our facility is a little bit further away than Mountain View. It's in Livermore. Uh, and uh, uh, we are actively looking at uh, a production site near Sacramento, so we'll all be California-based. Uh, uh, so uh, that's kind of the short update for me. Sure. Thank you. OK. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Richard Wang. I'm the founder and CEO at Kuberg. Uh, so it's very nice uh, to be here. <laughs> Uh, and I think particularly at a personal level, both because of my, my connection through my education with E as my advisor uh, during my PhD here at Stanford, and also very, very close ties to the California Energy Commission throughout our company's history, which I'll touch on a little bit uh, in my uh, introduction. Um, so uh, what is Kuberg? Uh, I started Kuberg nine years ago uh, out of my PhD program. We're based in San Leandro, California, uh, out in the East Bay by the Oakland Airport, and we're developing next generation high performance battery technologies based on lithium metal anodes and a unique non-flammable liquid electrolyte that we've developed in house. And so this ultimately lets us make batteries that are much, much lighter weight and also much more powerful uh, compared to existing lithium ion battery technologies. Uh, we are focused on a go to market uh, that is uh, targeted at early adopters that truly are in that high performance realm. Uh, electric aviation being one critical market, both vertical takeoff and conventional takeoff electric aircraft, where battery weight is absolutely critical to successfully electrifying segments of that industry, uh, as well as the high performance uh, automotive and uh, motorsports industry, uh, racing applications, uh, high end uh, premium cars, again, areas where historically have adopted new technologies and have been that leading edge for then taking technologies through to maturity as they then get deployed to more mass market applications. Um, and so uh, we were acquired uh, three years ago by Norfolk, uh, the leading uh, European-based uh, battery cell manufacturer, uh, developing uh, their own uh, cathode active material based on uh, nickel-rich high-performance uh, cathodes, their own cell manufacturing, building out gigafactories in Sweden, in Germany, and most recently announced in the Montreal region in Canada, uh, and then also doing uh, systems design and manufacturing for ESS products, as well as uh, developing recycling capabilities. So full, full vertical integration of all uh, uh, the key capabilities in the battery industry, uh, and really to drive towards a fully circular battery uh, value chain and maximum levels of sustainability. Uh, before I get into actually telling you a little bit more about Norfolk and the company, I wanted to also just share a bit of my, my story and experience with the CEC in particular. Um, so very, very grateful to everybody at the CEC, and particularly so uh, Chair Hochschild, uh, because the CEC has played a, quite a critical role in Kubrick's history. Uh, so looking back at 2019, uh, around um, early, mid-2019, we were in the process of fundraising for our Series A financing round. Uh, and at the time, uh, actually, the lead investor we had targeted uh, fell through at the last minute. And at that point, that meant that we were actually only uh, sort of at the lowest point, only about two months away from running out of money. And for anybody who has uh, run a company, you know that it takes about one to two months just to wind down and close down a company. So literally sort of you know, burning <laughs> to that last end of the, of the, the, the candle wick. Um, but it was right around the same time where very fortuitously we were then awarded our CEC grant. Um, and I've shown, shown uh, the chair this, this plot that I made uh, back to 2019 of my financial runway. And then we're about to run out of money. With the CEC, we then extended our runway because we could start billing the CEC for our development uh, funds. Uh, extended the runway out to about uh, eight months, which was a luxury at the time. But then used that momentum to then do some bridge funding with some uh, small investors. And then that momentum actually ultimately led towards, fortuitously, the discussions with Norfolk that then led to us signing a term sheet with Norfolk for our acquisition in early uh, 2020. And so really, I mean, we would not be here today um, as it is without really the strong support of CEC uh, over the last several years. And we just wanted to express my sincere gratitude at that support. And I think a great example of both uh, specifically the collaboration, both of course with Stanford and with the CEC in successfully fostering um, uh, entrepreneurial uh, successes. Uh, so with that, uh, let me just uh, quickly run through the, the rest of uh, my overview. So uh, I've already described Norfolk a little bit. Uh, this slide is, is a, a few months old. Uh, they've now raised, I think, uh, $13 billion 
So truly one of the largest players in the electrification uh, industry. Uh, the battery manufacturing industry, as we'll talk, touch upon, is extremely scale and process and capex intensive. And that's the scale you need to be at to truly compete at scale with the highly established and efficient uh, Asian players. Uh, very, very strong uh, order book, $55 billion in take or pay agreements with leading European uh, automotive OEMs, now about uh, over 5,000 people and already starting to deliver products out of their first gigafactory in uh, northern Sweden. And so what, what does Kubrick do as part of Norfolk? We are fundamentally developing their long-term advanced technology uh, roadmap, uh, what will eventually go into mass market vehicles in that 2030 timeframe, and ultimately developing a disruptive technology that long-term will deliver the range and capabilities and also cost competitiveness to drive that next wave of EV adoption. But then in the short term, our commercial focus is their high performance products unit. And so this is really where we're focus, focusing on early adopters that are pushing the boundaries on technology innovation and energy and power density uh, in the uh, battery world. We're also vertically integrated as Norfolk is from materials development to cell manufacturing and also do module and pack manufacturing in-house. So able to deliver full systems level solutions for our uh, pre premier uh, vehicle uh, customers. And uh, as I mentioned, the vertical takeoff is one key segment where you need incredible amounts of both energy and power density to sustain urban air mobility with uh, advanced battery technology. Also looking at both retrofit and clean sheet designs of fully electric and hybrid electric planes, um, uh, serving regional air mobility applications upwards of 500 miles of range. And then the high performance uh, world, uh, both in terms of um, uh, premium commercial programs at the high end, as well as motorsports and racing programs, where again, that legacy of innovation and fast moving to adopt new technologies fits very, very well with the differentiated performance capabilities of our battery. Uh, thank you. That's it for me. Well, this is very nice uh, introduction to what they have been working on. I'm very excited to see the progress. Uh, well, Richard, through your introduction, I feel like Stanford didn't teach you guys one thing. We didn't teach you how to handle it when you run out of money. That's something we didn't do teaching, but I'm glad to see Silicon Valley is really teaching you very well about this. Maybe this got to be in our curriculum. By the way, that also means as a faculty, I squeeze students away from uh, the pressure or money when they're in the lab. But I'll tell you what the reality is, 20 years at Stanford, you never feel like you, know, you have enough money to support students. You constantly run into the situation. You, you are going to run out of money. So I'm glad you are learning this. <laughs> Thank you. So with that, let's uh, now do our panel. Um, so you mentioned scale a little bit in uh, some of your uh, remarks, you know, four of you. Uh, if you look at the scale of the problem for battery manufacturing and supply chain, we roughly have about 1.4 billion cars, trucks, buses running in the world. If you kind of roughly calculate, you need 100 terawatt hour of battery pack. What does this mean, this scale? The world production of batteries so far, the already built manufacturing capacity plus the planned one, it's only one terawatt hour. So it will take 100 years to build what we need, 100 years. And then you kind of convert that into the weight. This 100 terawatt hour is multi-billion tons of batteries. So how many industries know how to make billion tons of stuff? Very few. Oil and gas, mm -hmm. cement, steel, maybe water, right? Very few industries know how to do that. So how does the scale guiding your business, building up your manufacturing, and think about supply chain? I'd love to hear your thoughts uh, on the scaling issue. Well, I can <clears throat> start on the raw material side. I mean, our approach it's very similar to, say, the chemical industry or petrochemicals industry might take to something like this. We're dealing with brine. We're converting it. Um, and <clears throat> to get to capacity for our particular development and matching in output is replication. <clears throat> so 
for this particular development, each turbine generator sets roughly 50 megawatts. It's a single flash unit, but we've ordered seven of those with Fuji Electric. Um, similarly with equipment, now there might be efficiencies by going bigger turbine, but the problem is with that we have to re-engineer everything and each stage would put us back 18 months. So scale and capacity is sort of a, one of those challenges, and I would imagine our colleagues here in the same boat. Um, if we spit out 25,000 tonnes per year per stage and we've got seven, we can go up to 17 stages. How quick can we do that? We know the resource can do it. So therefore it goes back from our perspective on the front end side, raw material side, is looking at it like big oil would look at this, uh, maybe having six drill rigs going at once and drilling 60 wells, um, bringing the well fields in and, and replicating the equipment to be able to ramp up as quick as possible because there's two challenges for us too is capacity with the contracts that CTR has alone is 120,000 tonnes per year, right? That's a, a lot of lithium we've got to produce in a relatively short period of time. So, so let alone getting to the numbers that you're quoting there, Yi, that's just off the charts. But yeah. So how, how much lithium value would have a total capacity? Is there any estimation? Well, in raw lithium, lithium hydroxide in tons, I can't give you the conversion numbers. You guys might be able to figure that out, but we're a, a 300,000 tons per year uh, lithium hydroxide, right? So it's in the world scale, it's a lot. Um, but you know, getting to capacity again is a challenge there. Recent DOE report, I think we can serve it. The, the Salton Sea field can serve us up to, I think it's roughly 450 million vehicles just out of that particular resource. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, you bring up a very good point, right? The moment you're starting to talk about making kilotons or gigatons of a product, you have to think about kilotons or gigatons of raw materials as well that go into making this product. And that's far from trivial, right? So in terms of, I can take one anecdote, and I'm pretty sure uh, Richard or Prabhaka will have other things to share. When we started the company, th that very much went into deciding what the product roadmap is. Right? Now, when you have to make gigatons and then you need six raw materials that go into making one product, that's the level of supply chain that you have to deal with, that you have to source. And that's far from trivial. Right? Same thing. Even if you have the raw material figured out, if you don't have a process technology which doesn't scale very well with volume, that is going to be a problem as well. So if you're both inventing a new product and a new process, by definition, you are not going to be able to meet the timeline that your customers want as well. Right? So scale brings with it a very interesting sort of challenges, which is physics teaches you more the ingredients you bring in, more the chance that things will go wrong. So keep it simple right? when it comes to the composition that goes in. So that very much informed. The aspect of being, being at scale means that you need to keep your supply chain very much in mind and front and center when it informing our product roadmap. And that's, once that is set for us, everything else was informed in terms of what we do downstream. So. I think the scale that you're talking about is really enormous. Uh, and we are, uh, I think, in the battery industry, we are not yet thinking that you'd replace all the cars or something like that. But uh, and even on the scale of, you know, uh, not terawatt hours, but gigawatt hours, it's still quite a significant challenge uh, today. And it's. Uh, at least in the, those kind of numbers, there are there have been other companies which have done it in the world. So there is, a, you know, at least some sort of a roadmap of what has been done already. But uh, to go from gigawatt to terawatt, that's a completely separate challenge uh, at this point. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, touching on Kuberg and, and Norfolk. So just uh, briefly on Kuberg. Uh, the scaling journey has been central to how I've formulated our entrepreneurial journey. The reason why we ultimately joined a company like Norfolk was to ease our ability to scale a fundamentally new and less mature uh, battery technology. And also the reason why we're pursuing high performance markets and not, let's say, mass market EVs from the get-go is because of the difficulties of fully scaling batteries to be cost competitive at the end of the day with uh, a very, very efficient incumbent uh, technology. And so, so scale, certainly at that small scale, when you talk about innovation, it really uh, is the core central challenge uh, in uh, new technologies making their way to market. Uh, but then also talking about the Norfolk experience, which certainly is scaling right now today, 
Um, you, you go to, you, know, you go to the, the factory Norfolk has, it's a 60 gigawatt hour uh, factory split into four blocks that they're building up in northern Sweden. You know, that facility alone, plus the associated cathode active manufacturing and recycling, is on the order of a $10 billion capital investment, just that one factory. And Norfolk has four of these going on um, in, in Sweden, two in Sweden, one in Germany, and one in Montreal. And that's just one company, which by the end of the decade can hopefully get to about 250 gigawatt hours per year of production. Uh, but as E said, we need probably estimates are on the order of, of several terawatt hours per year of production, uh, which is an incredible level of scale. And you look at, uh, now touching on battery cell manufacturing, what is, you know, uh, our, our CEO, Peter Carlson, likens cell manufacturing to the Formula One of manufacturing because it combines all the different elements of difficulties from all different industries. You need fundamentally the volume of goods to be at the scale of, let's say, oil and gas or, or cement or steel. But unlike those industries, you're making extremely complex, uh, discrete component parts with highly, uh, let's say, automated levels of precision from a mechanical assembly process, and then also uh, with significant amounts of chemical sensitivities and process capabilities to manufacture those materials in the first place, all coming together, together in clean and dry environments that then have to be manufactured. And if you have a defect, it's not a yield fault. If you have a defect, that's an actual safety risk and a fire risk that goes out into a vehicle. So both the, and then all doing all this at extremely high levels of efficiency and cost to actually make it affordable enough for uh, uh, customers to uh, put into cars. And so the combination of all of these is, as you can imagine, incredibly difficult. And I think what you see really as perhaps one, one real bottleneck in scaling is actually expertise. And so the people that can really make it happen. Um, and this is something where there is just a shortage, certainly uh, in uh, North America, but really arguably globally, in the talent and experience that has the know-how to know how to design and build and ramp up a battery factory. There's incredible amounts of know-how that just can't be documented and replicated easily. Um, and uh, even if you look at, let's say, the world-class established manufacturers like a CATL uh, in, in China uh, that has incredible levels of process and factory sophistication, uh, even there, when they try to translate that factory to a new environment, let's say, let's say in Germany, they have found significant delays and challenges because they don't have, let's say, the ability to translate that in terms of finding local expertise. And then as we try to scale with the IRA uh, in the U.S., certainly the, the macro environment now is there, and there's huge interest and investment in the U.S., but really where we have to catch up is how do we leverage all that know-how that uh, especially Asian uh, manufacturers have built up over the last couple of decades and deploy it efficiently to actually get these factories operational because that is really the core challenge. Mm -hmm. so, so Richard, what, what you just said lead to my next uh, question. Um, so uh, we are building localized supply chain here in the nation. And uh, the infrastructure law uh, giving a lot of subsidy and uh, free money to invest, uh, met, uh, a lot of them. And also, Inflation Reduction Act also provide a lot of incentive. So, so far, what has been working well? What do you expect, you hope for? And uh, how this will impact uh, building up the local supply chain right here so far? Love to see your, your thoughts, uh, four of you. Yeah. Um. I think I'd sort of go work backwards off Richard's point. We already, before the IRA come in, we were in discussions with some of our customers, the two the big auto work off takers that we have, about you know the advantages of co-location. So in our in our case, we have energy, water, mm -hmm. you know, workforce, the whole bit, um, plenty of land, you know, six thousand acres out there. So we you know we work backwards to the bagging operation. I'll start with that. So if we'd have bagged, the crying shame of all this was to bag a battery grade lithium hydroxide that doesn't ship that well to export it to another country for processing into a cathode and then maybe bring the cathode back to go into a battery or send it to Europe or wherever it ends up into a battery assembly, right? Um, by deleting our bagging operation, that's $85 million straight up just in straight capex, let alone opex. The 24,000 kilometres of carbon footprint to ship a raw material overseas to ship it back again. There's that cost, there's the VATs and the risk, like I said, it doesn't ship that well. So that's the fundamental we started with. So straight up, it made commercial sense. Um, we had a fair bit of pushback, of course, a lot of companies that are, that are established in, in other, uh, other areas, in Asia and other places, weren't too keen on co-locating to Imperial Valley or to California. 
um, those conversations have changed, and, and the IRAs really supercharged that. You talk about high-speed cars, this is something that's probably quicker. You know, so that, that conversation, I mean, the ready workforce is there. We are in negotiations now. Unfortunately, I couldn't share today who, we, who those negotiations are with PCAM and CAM, and that's where we're starting. PCAM makes sense. Uh, whether it's we provide LFP or hydroxide makes no difference to us. We simply put the pipe through the wall and delete the bagging operations. And these facilities will use 120 megawatts of clean green geothermal power and an offtake agreement. Suits us. We don't even have to put it on the grid. So it, it's starting to sort of come together and it's, you know, these, these visions and ideas that have been around for, for some years now, believe it or not, um, are really starting to come to fruition. So localising that, but I would say that it still needs to be in cognizant with partnerships with foreign nations to be able to get equipment, long lead items. I mean, since the guy that tried to do a U-turn in the Suez Canal, we still haven't recovered from that to get equipment in. <laughs> you know, it, it's just, it's re it really is. I mean, it's a real challenge. Um, so collaboration and companies like North Vault, North Vault and all the others and, and my colleagues here mm -hmm. are seeing the same thing. But fundamentally, it's starting to come together and I think fundamentally it's, it's happening quicker and, and I think the things we can do to improve it is you know, permitting process and the usual things like that. But with that, I'll, I'll pause. Can I add to what Rod was saying? Um, so what the IRA and the, the bipartisan infrastructure law grants have really helped is addressing one very critical problem, I think, which is uh, putting much needed capital on projects which have a very long return on capital, which historically has not been the subject of investments in the US in general. But that's just one piece of it. I, and I do think that's gone really well. There has been a lot of private sector investment into companies to uh, bring up manufacturing. But there is just so much more beyond just that, which is, and two of those critically, which Rod mentioned, are equipment, equipment innovation, and equipment production. Like, in Asia, equipment producers work hand in hand with the process control folks, so the iteration cycles are very, very fast, right? And the moment you have that, together with the know-how and the labor to be able to also operate this equipment, then you have this like tight-knit ecosystem to speed up manufacturing alone, right? So you need capital, but you need investment in equipment innovation locally as well to be able to sustain and stand up that supply chain really fast. Because that then motivates us to not have a hostile partnership, but more of a, how do you learn from, like, I'll just rip the bandaid off, right? There is no hiding the fact that China does something really well, which is standing up manufacturing for entire swaths of industries at a time much, much faster than anyone else can do. And it's just beyond just access to capital or technology development. It's this ecosystem that you have to stand up. And I think there is a lot one could conceivably learn in a, I think, a, in a collaborative way without necessarily you know, copying the technology, for example. Yeah, so I just touch upon this uh, another important topic. So uh, last year, uh, when uh, Governor Newsom visited uh, China, uh, there is a one-day um, dialogue called uh, the Great Wall Dialogue, U.S.-China Great Wall Dialogue. I participated in that one-day dialogue. It's very clear the two countries need to think about how to work together, particularly on climate issue and uh, you just brought out this, this point in, in China now supply roughly probably about somewhere around 70 percent of the global uh, battery market there's a lot of engineering capability manufacturing capability right there so instead of uh, cutting mm -hmm. so how the two sides can work together and uh, how do we benefit from uh, establishing maybe new type of working relationship. I think four of you are fighting in the flying line, really understand the value of that. So uh, and, any thought uh, on, on this issue? This is a little bit touchy issue, but I think it's very important for, for discussion as well. Yeah, I can uh, yeah. kick that off, uh, E. So um, uh, I think there was also a shot across the bow where um, uh, in response to, I think, semiconductor sanctions, China basically put a graphite on uh, their own export control list as potential. And there's a truly dominant uh, hold on the graphite industry, where if China decided to stop exporting graphite, literally it would stop the electrification industry globally. Uh, that's the power that they have in terms of that uh, critical supply chain. Um, I was just in, in China, actually, uh, near Shenzhen um, in uh, December, uh, visiting with a few of our key uh, partners there. And it, you know, one of them was one of the uh, top cell manufacturers uh, in China. And, and truly, I mean, when you visit and see for yourself 
what's happening on the ground there. I mean, it's, it's an enormous. And this is not just, let's say, you know, deploying low-cost labor to make cheap goods. I mean, the amount of sophistication in process and equipment designs and factories is, is enormous. And, and so when you look at localization, I think there's two big aspects that, that we talk about and really where also the opportunities are. I, I think the, on the material side, certainly there's an ability, and as you can see with everybody on this panelist, and, and very much motivation to localize material supply chains. That does take quite a long time in the US, and especially if you look at raw materials, then 12 years for permitting or new mines opening in the US, it's an extremely slow process that it will be hard to keep up in terms of the electrification timelines. But then moving to, to the factory itself, we're really where Asia has an incredible uh, lead as well is in that process and equipment sophistication and ecosystem. And you know, uh, this is uh, China, it's also uh, Korea, and still to some extent Japan, where the equipment that they can design and the people that know how to run this equipment uh, truly uh, is what really drives the ability to ramp up and build out a factory. And, and so again, long term, there's certainly efforts to, to, to localize. Norfolk, for example, has been partnering with the uh, German industrial ecosystem to train a lot of these automation uh, vendors and so forth on designing battery equipment. But again, all of this is very, very long lead times. It's not gonna move fast enough necessarily for, for building the scale that we need to build this decade. And I think that's really where you know, figuring out how to, let's say, have, uh, I think, uh, collaborative relationships with Asia really allows us to then go that much faster in, in electrification. Um, of course, with all the, let's say, geopolitical elements layered on top, but I think from a technology perspective, like truly when you see what they're, they're doing um, in the factories there, it's incredible in terms of the level of um, efficiency they've, they've driven. Uh, yeah. uh, I think uh, it's all been well covered uh, already, but, uh, I just want to say that uh, obviously the one thing to learn is that uh, you need to scale manufacturing. I mean, to achieve the cost level, manufacturing needs to be at a certain scale. It doesn't have to be at a terawatt hour scale, but at least at a gigawatt hour scale. Uh, and uh, I mean, that at least, uh, you, know, if you're, uh, you know, we can learn from there, so. Any other thought to add in? You. I think um, <clears throat> I concur. I think there's a hybrid version there. I mean, I think the US needs its minerals independence back. That's probably part of it. I'm not going to get into the political debate here, but um, <clears throat> equipment um, and co-location skill set, it's coming. And I think, you know, it's a collaborative effort. I mean, South Korea works well. China works well. There's no doubt about it. Um, you know, coming up with a hybrid across maybe it's a, you know, some of the Chinese companies, equipment providers co-locate here. Um, you know, they, there's good products, good design, good skill sets like we're all been talking about here. Um, and we could, that's how we're going to ramp up. The, the reality is, I think it's 1.4 million EVs sold. I think if I'm, if I'm correct, quoted by uh, John Podesta the other day, uh, you know, we got to move. You know, this is uh, just so far behind. The way we do that is collaboration. I think that the CATL Ford um, project is also a good uh, lessons learned. I mm -hmm. mean, Ford it's, it itself has its own, let's say, challenges in electrification and it's cutting back. Uh, but I think the, 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 the thesis of that project is that, you know, leveraging CATL's uh, IP and technology on process, mm -hmm. they could then build a factory in the US that much faster. But you look at what actually happened to that project, there was a lot of criticism in the US about the involvement of CATL. And then also actually from, from China, to my understanding, CATL itself faced quite a bit of political pressure not to engage in the project because they were afraid of their own uh, IP and process technology then leaking to the US and then training the US on how to manufacture. And so that's an example where then the geopolitical tensions out ultimately outcompeted, let's say, the interest in building a sort of effective business together. But I mean, those kinds of examples are where you could really then think about how do you start learning and leveraging technologies that have already been developed there to build factories much, much faster. Yeah, I think this, uh, you all point out the, uh, I will say, opportunities. We can explore uh, the mechanism, how to work together. Before I open up to uh, the floor for the questions, uh, let me ask you just briefly, each one of you, very briefly, what are the pain points you are facing? Uh, one or two in your company, you can uh, share with us and uh, so uh, maybe the, uh, all the audience can help you come up solutions. <laughs> maybe. I, hope so. <laughs> um, I think we're still 
you know, in the US and California, we're getting there. We haven't caught up to this new age. Like, think about it, the new age of oil, if you like. This is, you know, white oil, it's coming on. But we're all still referring to the 1940s handbook, how to build an industrial building and how to permit a project that's to improve the, the, the environment. And, you know, the process and time for permitting each stage by each stage. There needs to be a more programmatic approach. I, I would applaud Chair Hostchild's leadership. I think AB 205 and other there's pieces of legislation that really stream that. But you know we're still caught up in some archaic policy, power generation over 49.9 megawatts, all these sorts of things that that really have been designed for a very maybe a very credible purpose in the 70s or 80s or whenever, but they have no place right now. Um, it's, yeah, time and timing, if we're going to be competitive, it's speed, speed to market. You know, we're still, everyone, we still follow sequel. We do the, the string, most stringent environmental reviews and EIRs on the planet, I believe. Um, but the time that take and in trays, they sit there and it just, it just kills, ultimately, time kills projects. That's the reality, no matter what it is. Highly appreciate that. Uh, through my own startup, I also learn about this process is very slow. Yeah, that needs to be improved. Mm -hmm. Any? I can go um, keep stealing my points, right? <laughs> uh, totally. I think that the, the aspect about permitting and regulations, one, um, one aspect is, once again, in countries that are used to commercializing technologies very quickly, you have blueprints to go from lab scale to like production scale very fast. Something which startups like us could benefit, uh, MentorChem, could benefit from is some support for also pre-commercial scale, like pilot scale demonstration, whether it's you know a, a shared pilot scale facility or whatnot. That is, um, it's like the classic valley of death where you can develop a technology, but you don't make it at a relevant enough quantity for someone to say, I will you know, sponsor you know, your plant, for example, for building a plant, right? But that takes money to build as well, right? So I think having the ability to have these intermediate scale demonstration facilities, which are, and this is very common, once again, we understand in Korea and China, which allows you to like incrementally get to the scale very fast. So that, to me, is like one area where government support could be super beneficial. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, permitting is clearly the pain point, but uh, I think uh, also, there is, uh, I mean, traditionally in the U.S., there has been a lack of patient capital. I mean, but that's, I don't think that's something that the government can do much about. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, although the, I think the IRA and the Infrastructure Act is definitely helping. In uh, essentially, I think the VCs tend not to go for a, how should I say, a project that has a gestation period of 12 years <laughs> or whatever, even even five years. So that's something, uh, but I don't have a real solution for that. And I'll touch on the, the financing topic as well. I think especially with uh, interest rates being uh, where they are uh, this year, you know, financing is much more difficult than it was uh, two years ago. And at the end of the day, how do you build these you know, absurd terawatt hour levels of battery capacity? It's with absurd amounts of financing at the end of the day. Um, and from the private markets, they're of course fickle, dependent on interest rates, but also I think touching upon um, government policy, I mean certainly both CEC and DOE in their own rights have been very uh, forward leaning, uh, CEC in particular, and you have the IRA, but you know, just sharing one experience I, I had is uh, I was also leading the site selection process for Norfolk in North America. And ultimately, Norfolk did not end up building a factory in the US. They ended up building in Canada. And, and, and the reasons for that are, are complex, certainly not only about money. You know, Canada has other benefits in terms of sustainable power and access to raw materials. But in terms of how, how you engage at different levels of government, there was a, an incredibly coordinated uh, sort of uh, approach between federal and provincial and municipal levels in Canada and how they put together incentive packages, how they think about permitting, and so forth. Whereas in the US, it's fairly fractured at all different levels, and in general, especially federally, other than this, let's say, opportunistic grants that might come you know, once in a time, there isn't really an economic development mechanism at the federal level in the US uh, and to help tie it together with the states. And so if you look at just the competitiveness, the US has blunt force instruments throwing you know, hundreds of billions of dollars with the IRA, and certainly that is very effective and, and compelling on its own. But it doesn't have, let's say, the finesse ability to work with companies in the way that other countries do. Now, uh, let me open the floor for the question. This question here from the lady. Uh, 
Thank you, panelists. I think we would be remiss today to not address one of the elephants in the room, which is over half of our attendees will be retired by 2045, certainly by 2050. <laughs> uh, I'm going to do a shameless and proud plug that the state treasurer's office is hiring, as well as LBNO. And I worked at the Berkeley Lab, and I want to thank them because of them. I went back to grad school, completed it, got a public policy uh, internship in DC. And once you get that bug, the policy, the research, the government bug, you can never get rid of it. You always come back. So I wanted to ask the panelists about their social responsibility, internships. I wanted to read the um, control thermal resources social responsibility slide because it covered all those points really, really well. Um, so they create up to 480 construction jobs. Over 940 are direct good paying jobs. 90% are community residents. Um, and a lot of them are 60% women and people of color. Now in California, Latinas are only 20% of the population, yet they comprise 50% of the mothers in the state. So what plan do you have to ensure that you are incorporating all those good things that will provide us with the workforce of the future and that they're great, high road, high paying jobs and their careers of the future? Thank yeah. you. No, great question. Thank you. Um, so after 12 years of community engagement, I guess the Lithium Valley Commission, we're in a unique, I mean, Imperial Valley is an ag area. Um, we've got south of the border, north of the border. And what we learned that the, the number of 90%, no one believed us on that. And I'll give you one real simple example. If you can operate a John Deere tractor and a pump and a pipe and work on ag, there's short IV college tuition courses and we recently employed a few young guys that were on 34,000 a year, like just struggling to get through life. There's one young guy that's got four kids, can go to college, struggling, working on six ranches. And he'd done his short course, he started on 82,000 as an operator. And you know, now the kids are off to college and whatever. So that's what I mean by organic growth. And I think, you know, the ratio of how these operator jobs work, you know, you're talking a 24-7 operation, that's one thing about geothermal, as I'll say it again, the sun doesn't set on geothermal, and, and like, <laughs> but it, 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 it really, it does put that in there, and I'll, I'll use the other example, Berkshire Hathaway are the biggest employer, private employer in, in Imperial Valley, they have 300 odd jobs, they've been operating over 40 odd years, this is an extension of that, so something that's known and not new and novel, so I think, um, and the broad spectrum, spectrum of jobs too, you know, you d it's not all white coats and as much as we folks in the room here, that's probably represents 5%, you know, PhDs and, and labs. The rest is pure operators and maintenance and things like that. So let me just chime in on that. So definitely, uh, uh, as Rod said, uh, most of the jobs in this kind of a scale-up area are going to be for operators and technicians. And uh, actually, at Sparks, we are uh, setting up a training center as part of the pilot line that we, are, uh, we have. And uh, the training center is going to train uh, you know, operators and technicians like a three-month kind of a training course, and, so, and then hire them at the end of that. So that's kind of our uh, planning for uh, you know, getting all these people uh, good paying jobs, and these will be good paying jobs. Obviously, they're not going to be kind of, uh, not to say bad things about McDonald's, but uh, uh, should be higher paying than McDonald's. So, and they're good, uh, uh, you know, and uh, these will be four shifts, you know, because all this equipment has to be operated 24 seven. So uh, definitely there's going to be quite a lot of good paying jobs. Maybe adding, adding a little bit, uh, you all know uh, a year ago Stanford, Stanford started the uh, Door School of Sustainability. Our Dean Alun was on the stage a few times. Uh, speaking of developing talent, educating more people in an equitable way, uh, and the Door School is this uh, big plan. How do you educate instead of only, you know, several thousand students, in addition to several thousand students, how do you amplify education effect to develop the talent to millions? So this is a scalable education, I would say. Uh, this is a deep inside the uh, door school. 
Uh, not only that, uh, we have now set up the uh, Sustainability Accelerator. I, I serve as the founding director, a uh, faculty director of this organization. It's actually thinking, thinking about <laughs> scaling uh, of the impact and technology scaling, processing scaling, policy scaling, right? education scaling is part of that as well. Financing scaling, and uh, we put scale upfront uh, eventually, to go to scale, you got to address the equity issue. Without that, the scaling will not be possible. Um, we can take one more question. Right there. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Leopold Peisler, PhD student from ETH Zurich. And my research is on supply chains of batteries. So thanks so much for your insights so far. I'd like to address another elephant in the room, maybe, and that is recycling. Um, so I'm curious, so back in Europe and also in, in China, I understand that recycling is much more on the agenda of stakeholders in the battery value chain. That's at least my personal impression. And I'm wondering what are your thoughts on the role of the United States in the recycling technology? Because I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if maybe we should avoid the mistake of not seeing a uh, technology that needs to be developed for various reasons, uh, but instead catching up then maybe 10 years later when, when you, know, uh, you realize that is actually necessary. And then you, you don't spearhead the innovation, but instead look at other players. Thank you very much. I thank you so much. I was wondering who is going to ask about recycling <laughs> finally. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I can, I can take a stab at that uh, from the, the Norfolk uh, perspective. Um, so recycling is a technology that has matured a lot in the last uh, five years, and at this point, you're able to recycle fairly efficiently and get 95% reclamation rates on materials like nickel and cobalt, at least in uh, NMC-based uh, batteries. So the technology works, factories are being built out, and capacity is being built out. Uh, I think what you see, I think, is actually, I, I would say I'm fairly optimistic on the recycling uh, side. I don't think it's a solution to all of our problems necessarily, but it's moving very well. And I think the reason is fundamentally the materials in the batteries are so valuable intrinsically that there is a market developing by nature to reclaim end-of-life batteries uh, for recycling. And in the U.S., you have companies like Redwood Materials as well that has done a lot in building out um, uh, recycling capabilities, and, and there is, it, it's actually a very, very profitable industry for the, the EV battery recyclers. So all that is in motion. The batteries are not getting thrown to landfills, and they're too valuable for that to happen. Uh, recycling, on the other hand, though, doesn't solve, let, uh, let's say, a lot of the critical materials supply issues for probably the next 20 years or so. And really, it's a function of how quickly the industry is growing. Because it's growing so fast and the needs are greatly accelerated, you just don't have enough materials in circulation uh, with which to recycle and supply uh, your battery needs. So we're going to be dependent on really uh, virgin materials uh, for probably the next couple of decades. But then as you then eventually, of course, throughout the journey and as you get to stability, that's really when recycling will be key uh, to, to sort of kick, kick things off and then eventually to then close the loop from a circular perspective. Um, from the other side of the, I'm not in, inside the buildings like these guys are, but from a greenfield perspective, uh, the battery manufacturers that we've been talking to all incorporate the recycling in the program because they, they're trimming extrusions, they, they, you know, they, they have recycling anyway to a certain point. And I would say that, that um, that Richard's point is that until there's a sufficient capacity, like these batteries I think are lasting a lot longer, number one, than people anticipated. I've heard of 2013 batteries still going and these sorts of things. Getting core capacity to be able to justify it. But I can say that the new build facilities, the ones at least in our uh, humble opinion, have all incorporated recycling. So our campus has that in inbuilt, not as a separate facility, but within uh, the, the actually uh, assemblers. I, I think we probably run out of the time. Uh, with that, let's thank the fantastic panel.